Back in our Father's Word, the great book of Mark. This teenager, Mark, who walked with the disciples, though he was not a disciple, gives you a perfect eyewitness to what happened and gives you a perfect accounting of it and makes it a beautiful book. Let's pick it back up, if we may, here in chapter 7, where Christ is kind of warning them. It's what you hear and what you put into the body as far as food is concerned. That won't send you to hell. That's just a sin against your health. It's what comes out of your mouth if you start teaching falsely. Or if you allow these fragments of the doctrine and the traditions of men to work into your vocabulary or into your teachings, you're in a heap of hurt. And then, inasmuch as you would learn in the great book of Matthew that until the crucifixion, Christ was sent only to the house of Israel. But here, in this ministry that he's on today, he's going to make a 50-mile trip from his home all the way to Tyre, and 50 miles back for one woman, and that woman is um, not even an Israelite. What does it document? That salvation would be opened after the crucifixion to whomsoever would, if, there's a big if here, if they have faith. So all these things that he has taught us so far concerning faith and belief comes together in this one thing, showing you how God does love all of his children and how at the proper time and place all things fit in the plan of God because God loves all of his children. And as it's written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to God. He's got them already. They're his. You don't get around to giving your soul to God. You're his, bought, paid for for his to do with whatever he so chooses according to your works and faith and belief. So having said that, let's pick it up as he begins this journey. Chapter 7, the great book of Mark, verse 24, as now word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, 50 miles. And he entered into an house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. In other words, he was too popular. 25. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. Now, we're already beginning to see signs of faith here. She fell at his feet. Why? Well, let's find out. 26. The woman was a Greek. Just let you know right at coming out the gate. She was a Gentile a Syrophoenician uh, by nation. Uh, Syrophoenician called that way that because she was from Syria and not from Africa, which is to say Libya, Phoenician. She is a Phoenician from uh, Syria. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. She wanted that evil spirit gone. Now, what, what does that document to you? Think about it a minute. She knew he could do it. She didn't ask, can he do it? She knew he could. She had heard of his reputation, 50 miles away from where he was even. 27, but Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. That's not a statement of degradation. It's a statement of timing. The house of Judah and the house of Israel had to be prepared first for Messiah. And then Messiah, on paying the price, salvation would be open to everyone. But this woman, knowing he could, have, could perform these miracles, that he had to be of our Heavenly Father. She didn't have any doubt about that. Verse 28. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Even they can pick that up. In other words, I, I, would, I would like to have just a touch, not for my sake, but for my daughter's sake. 
I mean, here we have humility, we have compassion for her own, and we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those things coming together to touch the heart of Almighty God. Verse 29, And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And I want you to know, he didn't have to go there. He didn't have to see the daughter. He had enough power and authority to drive the evil spirit out without even being in the presence of the daughter. Evil spirits must always obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when, why that when he gave us authority, that is to say believers, the authority to cast out evil spirits, as it is written in uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 19 and eight, 18 and 19, following. Um, he, he, you do it in Christ's name. And there is power there that's dunamis, dynamite, okay, in the spirit. How precious it is to serve him and to have access to that cleansing ability of love compassion, and assisting and helping those that need that particular help. Uh, so he, he tells her, you go home. Verse 30, and when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out of her daughter, and her daughter laid upon the bed. She was cleansed. One, and again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came again until the Sea of Gal came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. In other words, it's important that you note it's important enough to the Lord Jesus Christ that this lesson be taught that he walked fifty miles from Galilee to Tyre. And Tyre, Tyrus is one of Satan's main strongholds. I mean, he's called the king of Tyrus and the prince of Tyrus in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Even in the 18th and 19th verse, he is called this when God said, I promise you at the end I'm going to turn you to ashes from within. I mean, he was right in the nest. But he walked that 50 miles to document every soul is worth saving. It is not the multitudes of souls that you save, it's that one. Every one is a child of the living God and is important. And this is what he would emphasize. Uh, uh, how many people today, now he didn't have um, a nice easy ride, he didn't have a horse, he didn't have something there to, uh, he, he chug a lug right down the road, walked a hundred miles there and back. Fifty there, fifty back. To touch one child. That's emphasizing how important it is, beloved. To know, to love, to understand. But also, here, this was God with us. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Emmanuel, God with us. But he didn't send somebody. Now, now, understand, he could have just as easily, even from Galilee have caused that demon to depart that girl. But he went the distance so that you know, and it is documented, that that soul was worth it. And he walked those many miles. How many of you would walk a hundred miles to save a soul? Okay. Well, you might think then how much he cares. And was this an Israelite? No, it wasn't. It was a Syrophoenician. It's a Gentile, and proving that that floodgate would be open sooner or later after the crucifixion, and whomsoever would, that um, that saving grace would be available to them. That is one of the most beautiful lessons that Christ has ever taught, of his compassion and the fact that, of, of the attitude that he would have you have if you're going to serve him. It's precious. Okay, next verse, please. Verse 31, 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf, 
and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. Uh, you that have eyes to see and ears to hear. Three, And he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. He anointed him with the very touch of Yahweh, of, of um, the only begotten, of Emmanuel, God with us, right on this person's ears. What, what is that saying? Christ can give you ears to hear. A lot of people can hear sound. They can hear a tone. But can you hear the Word of God? That's what's important. If you can hear the Word of God with understanding, get, get it? Example, if you can hear the 100-mile trip that he just made, if you have ears to hear that, to know and to understand it, then you're blessed. And looking up to heaven, he sighed, and see, he groaned because of the suffering of this one that couldn't see and had an impediment. It couldn't speak, that is to say, to share the word even. And he said unto him, Ephatha. This is an Aramaic word. What does it mean? That is, be opened. And so it was that those ears were opened that he could hear the word of God. That he could hear and understand that... Um, this one, in touching him, had give him that hearing. 35, and straightway, that's immediately this vivacious youth writing this mark. That means instantly his ears were opened and the string or the band of his tongue was loosed. And he spake plain. He was a capable servant of God now. Why? Because Christ had given him ears to hear and ridded the speech impediment because, quite frankly, one that doesn't have ears to hear has an impediment in speech because they cannot speak the true Word of God. The band must be loosed, the ears open, the mind touched, and the Holy Spirit entering therein absorbing the very truth of the word and the simplicity in which Christ taught it, giving this lad the ability to go forth. Uh, verse 36, And he charged them, that means sternly, that they should tell no man. The more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. They were thrilled. They were excited. Here this one not only could hear now, but he could speak and carry forth that beautiful truth of the miracle that had happened to him. Verse 37, And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And that's what the truth does, beloved. It, uh, please take that down one notch deeper to the spiritual level. Give, pray If you do not have ears to hear, pray that you do. That God opens your ears to the simplicity in which he teaches that you understand all parables. For God taught in parables only for the election's sake, who would speak, who would take it forward. And you might think, well, who then can give us authority to do that? He does. You know, you can attend many, many universities. You can do many, many things. But until God touches you, chooses you, gives you it, that's the truth, then you're in a heap of hurt as far as having the bands loose from your tongue whereby you can go forward with the Word of God. Only in Christ. 
and in him he can cut it he can get it done I don't know how's your faith do you have enough faith to ask him if you have trouble understanding all you got to do is ask him to give you understanding to assist you in absorbing chapter 8 verse 1 in those days the multitude being very great is growing and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, Here again we're in a wilderness place, getting late, but Christ wants to double witness this event. Verse 2, I have compassion on the multitude. And he did. Because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Verse 3, and if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. They're not going to make it. For divers of them came from far. They've got a long, long way to go. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, the uh, long way to go is to help many of you if Christ feeds you. Keeps you out of that long trip to Hades if you're not careful. In other words, his truth will show you the path when you're fed properly with his word to find that way. Verse 4, And his disciples answered him, From whence came a man, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? How can we do that? We don't have a bakery out here. Verse 5, and he asked them, how many loaves have you? And they said, seven. Six. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. Notice, again, exactly the same, in order, no mob, no shouting. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people, seven and they had a few small fish. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So here again, we have that fish, which is symbolic of Christianity. And why you will always find that fish sign, even out in the wilderness and deserts of this great nation, when you find ancient writings, you'll always find that fish usually drawn on a stone higher than any message from Babel. And of course... The cipher, as we found in the last time, is, um, um, is uh, iota, chi, theta, um, and sigma, which is to say, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's what Christianity is all about. Verse 8. So they did eat and were filled. Not, not just pretending, they were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. This time seven is spiritual completeness. How many baskets did they have the last time? Twelve. Twelve being the number for the house of Israel. There's always plenty left over when God feeds. You don't ever have to be scarce with it. That is to say, skimpy. When it comes to feeding his people with truth, don't be skimpy. Lay it out smooth, plain, and level, whereby everyone can understand that has eyes to see and ears to hear, to know the very Word of God. But what is the main thing he wants you to learn from this? You learned it well, I hope, in the first time. How soon, though, people can forget is in those seven baskets, they're fragments. They have been around people that just came to the mob, okay? They, they wanted a fish sandwich. And also, they wanted to see the miracles to, as a sideshow. In other words, their hearts were not in the proper place. And they would awe and ooh and put in their little traditions of what this man said or that man said. And you can get some bad teachings. And that can hurt your flock badly. It can do much damage. You've got to always nip traditions in the bud. Do not allow it. Put it out 
from the children of God. And uh, basically, that's what he wants you to know about these seven baskets. It can be wonderful to have seven baskets left over, but if it's a basket full of trouble, you're in a heap of hurt. You're not blessed. Verse 9, And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. First time 5,000, this time 4,000, nine all together in their families. That's a lot of people. Ten, and straightway, immediately, he entered into a ship with his de disciples, and he came into the port or the uh, parts of uh, Dalmanitha. Dalmanitha. Uh, Dalmanitha is one of the best translations we can get. It's cold spring, cold fountain, cold fountain. Eleven. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. You've got to be careful here. I mean, here they have the Son of God before them. And here they have this one that fed 4,000 in the wilderness. Naturally, there would be some along that would have known that, but the Pharisees, they still, they want to entrap him. That's what they're looking for. Do you think uh, for a moment that in your travels you are better than Christ? Do you think they're not going to try to entrap you also? That along the way you're going to be tried? There will be people that will try to shadow or darken or damp or change or cause problems to a true ministry. But you can never let that bother you. You can never. But they're always there and they're always waiting but what greater sign could they want than to have the Son of God walking right before them and performing miracles? And they're looking for a sign? That's one of the reasons God loves you all so much. You haven't seen what these people saw. And you still believe. And you still have faith. How precious that is. Uh, Verse 12, and he sighed deeply in his spirit. He groaned and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation, not more than they had, which was the Messiah. 13, and he left them and entered into the ship again, departing to the other side. You couldn't make any headway there because of the opposition. Why? It, wasn't, it was not a peaceful gathering. 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Here we go again. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. 15. And he charged them, saying, Take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees of the leaven of Herod. Again, you beware the traditions of men. Is it how soon they forget? And then he, he nails this lesson home. Remember, this is probably brought out better in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 11, where he says, It's the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees I'm warning you about, not how many chunks of, of fragments you got in that basket. It's how many fragments of lies and false information you've absorbed from the gathering. They, they reasoned among themselves, saying it's because we have no bread. 17, listen to his teachings. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye? Because you have no bread. Why are you worried about that? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand, have you... Have you your heart yet hardened? Is the habitual way of man, his doubting soul, got in the way of this? That's what being the translation, 18. Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember? We went through this once before. You see, bear in mind now, do you want your eyes open and do you want your hearing open? Christ can do it. Verse 19. 
When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, and Jim, twelve. We had twelve of them. Twenty. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, seven. Twenty-one. And he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? You know, and I'm sure that um, in his teaching it was a disappointment that they could not remember. Food had nothing to do with it. I mean, they're in a bad shape. They're in a ship. They've only got one loaf of bread. And they're thinking about that's the habitual or the hardening of the mind. It's the habitual nature of man to worry about some things that are not all that important compared to the spiritual mission you're on. Compared to that mission, you must have eyes to see and ears to hear. God will speak to you through the Word and as well as other ways sometimes if you'll listen, if you have ears to hear. And if you have eyes to be able to see the miracles of God and recognize it as, a, as the hand of God. You see, uh, many might say, well, I wonder if that still happens. How dare you? How dare you say God doesn't exist anymore? Because that's what you would be saying. He's as real today as he has ever been. He's on the throne the same today as he has always been. He is there for you night and day. He is with you night and day. And all you have to do is talk to him because he wants to hear from you. That's why he would say, as I've said many times to you in Isaiah 43, 26, remind me of my promises I made to you. Let's talk about them, and that way I can justify you. That means I can make it just with you. I'll give you understanding. And you'll, you'll, you'll be a go-whiz here. You can get it done. And uh, so that's what you have to do. So I'm sure that when he had to remind them the second time, and, and I, I'm sure that they were pretty sharp uh, people, but many of these things were done for your edification today, for you to learn to know and to understand. So there we were. And um, he simply just left it. At that, verse 22, and he cometh to Bethsaida or Bethesda today, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Here we go again. He's going to give you another example of sight. 23, and he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. What's he doing? Taking him out of the town. And when he had <coughs> spit on his eyes. He put his hands upon him, and he asked him if he saw aught. What, what do you see? <clears throat> 24, and he said, and he looked up, and he said, I see men as trees walking. I want you to see the depth that Christ is giving this man to see. The trees in the garden, the tree of life, and the tree of good and evil. <clears throat> and the fact of the planting of God's children being related to his trees. When he sees men as trees walking, he sees and understands. He has eyes and ears to hear and to know and understand the word. He could understand Ezekiel chapter 31 where it speaks of Satan as nothing but a tea asher, a little box cedar tree. Verse 25, And after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored, and he saw every man clearly. He could see the truth. <clears throat> Excuse me, Christ can give you eyes to see if you ask. They brought this man to him. He couldn't see. Now he sees clearly. When many times people can see with their flesh eyes, but their spiritual eyes, they're blinder, blinder than a bat. Only a bat at least can maneuver by radar. People can't. And spiritually, they need those spiritual eyes opened. Christ is the way to do that. That's what he's teaching you here. 
Verse 26, And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in town. In other words, it wasn't yet time for the full miracles to come forth before until after the crucifixion, and so it was. How precious the Word of God and how the analogies, analogies that he utilizes to bring us the truth. <clears throat> movement after movement, person after person, encounter after encounter, every one of them extremely important. The touch of the man, the touch of Christ on humanity. To absorb that, to, to follow it, to utilize it, to build your own character upon it so that you're never disappointed and so that you always have him with you and that you're never outside of his realm. How beautiful it is to be a servant of the living God. <clears throat> Excuse me. He used many analogies, each one important, important to you today, if you want to see and if you want to hear. Make sure, as we, if we were to analyze what has just happened, that you watch out for the fragments being the traditions of men. You can have pretty good spiritual sight. And the warning about the fragments is it'll dull it. Fragments of doctrines that are false will dull your spiritual sight, where you'll almost lose sight of the Word of God till you will just see it, just a vague picture. Why did Christ take him out in the forest where the trees were, of course? So he could teach him concerning men. I don't know, has he taught you? That's a powerful, powerful chapter. Okay, Pastor Murray, my name is, um, is Justin. I'm 10 years old, and I watch the program with my stepmom, and I have a question. What is a Berean? Please explain, and can you give me where I can find it in the Bible? Thank you. I, I'm not sure of your spelling, and I'm, I think you're... You're thinking of Berean. Beer in the Hebrew tongue is a well, and Berean means well watered. And um, um, you would have to have your mom check it out in um, your Strong's Concordance. And if, if and if this is not the word you're thinking about, because you have spelled this B U R R A N, and um, I'm not sure what I, I have to go by Berean which is well watered. I hope that's what you're asking. If not, you submit it again. Have your stepmom help you. She's, she's good that she watches with you. Marie from Oklahoma, where in the Bible does it talk about the Ice Age and, um, the, and um, a report of the, the dinosauruses? Well, in Job chapter 40, they are called, the dinosaur is called the behemoth. And uh, you, you recognize it by the description, a perfect description of a dinosaur with a tail like a cedar tree of Lebanon. All right, that's huge. The dinosaur is the only animal. I know some people translate that as a hippo, and they got a little pig's tail, okay? So, and a, and a, a hippo doesn't eat off the top of the mountains like the dinosaur does, so... And that's uh, what happened before the Ice Age. The Ice Age is verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, when, when um, the earth not was void and without form, but that it became void and without form. Instant freeze. Uh, Melanie from Oklahoma. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, it says, There is no other God besides me. The word God is a little g. Why is this? Because it wasn't speaking of our Heavenly Father, the only God. <clears throat> it was talking about someone that makes a God out of a stick of wood or something. Naturally, it never should be an uppercase. Lowercase, a statement of degradation against their God. Uh, Joe from Wisconsin. I'm sorry, West Virginia. West Virginia, Joe. 
In Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I am confused whether he is talking about the first earth age or the second earth age. In the second part, he says, and, and does this mean, and does this mean something? The specific Hebrew, it says, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. It did not say when. It was millions of years ago. And then in verse 2, the Hebrew is very specific. Tuhu vavuhu. That is to say, not that he create, God doesn't create anything void and without form. But the word is that it became void and without form. Why? Satan's rebellion. God destroyed that earth age. He could have destroyed the children, but he loves them. So he destroyed that earth age and then brought in this earth age. That's why God's elect were chosen in the first earth age, because it's Satan's rebellion. They stood against him there, and God knows they will do it again here. Uh, Thurston, uh, Thurston from California. What is the unforgivable sin? I have heard that it is denying that the spirit and not believing in God. I have heard that something as basic as a thought in your head questioning something falls under that. Is it, uh, if, is it not okay to question things in your head? Of course it is. <clears throat> the unforgivable sin, you need to know what it is. God is very understanding and he loves his children and he knows the great learning process that one goes through to go from a babe to an adult in the Word, even as Paul would say, when I was a babe, I spake as a babe, and now as an adult, I can see more clearly. Okay, So uh, the unpardonable sin you will find in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. It's only for God's elect. If you are delivered up before the Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan is what it's saying, and you refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that's unforgivable. But do you know something? One of God's elect will never, ever, ever allow that. If anything, they talk too much. Okay. They're, they're going to pop off something to Satan before the Holy Spirit gets there. There's none of them going to be guilty of denying the Holy Spirit to speak through them. But it is wonderful for you to doubt things and to look at things and always weigh out in the Word of God what is true and what is fact. That's, that's, the, that's called the process of learning. Anytime you have someone that tells you you can't think something through for yourself, you may be getting into a cult. A cult likes to do your thinking for you. A good teacher will always teach you how to think for yourself, and I mean come down on anybody that tries to interfere with your freedoms in this great nation, freedom of, of uh, religion and uh, the freedom of speech and your freedom to think and enjoy that freedom. Don't ever let anyone try to take that away from you or say God would want to, that he wouldn't. Uh, Luke from Delaware, what is the high Sabbath? The high Sabbath is Passover. It comes around every year. You see, the reason it is the high Sabbath is because, as you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover. And Passover is always the 15th day of the first month. Well, what does that mean? It means that the 15th day after the spring equinox, which is the same every year if you go by solar, not lunar. We're children of light. You don't go by the moon. All prophecies given in months or moons is of Satan. We're children of light, solar. So 15 days after the spring equinox, 14th preparation, 15th the day. That's the high Sabbath of all Sabbaths. It falls on different days of the week, and whatever week it happens to fall in, that becomes the high Sabbath, and the regular Sabbath is simply uh, the second Sabbath.
of that particular week. Paul from Minnesota. Is it okay to work on Sunday when you have a job that requires you to work on weekends, such as nursing? Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that nurses and doctors and people that must work on weekends to provide services, policemen and so forth, it's the better the day, the better the deed. And it's wonderful that people care and with compassion. Uh, you know, you can still rest in the Lord. That Sabbath is rest. And resting is to have peace of mind in Him. And uh, that does not prevent your prayers or anything else. And it, it is a precious work. Uh, Gordon from Illinois. Where in the Bible does it discuss the parable of the fig tree? Well, uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13. We'll be getting to it here in a few days. And it is the parable of the end generation. The generation of the fig tree is the final generation of this particular dispensation of time. And it is when Israel become a nation again in the year of our Lord, 1948. Okay, Reuben from Arizona. My question is, I have a friend since childhood who knows right from wrong, biblically, but has recently watched a documentary movie called, I'm not even going to give the name of this, the, something about God wasn't there, and now believes that the Bible is not real, that anyone could have written it. He has tried to argue with me about the Bible and says that he cannot understand why I believe in it, uh, God or Jesus. Don't, don't give him the time of day anymore. He's trying to, uh, I mean, that's what today's lecture was about. If he wants to go that way, stop casting your pearls before swine. Okay. Um, he's trying to pull you away. Any person that takes the time to read Psalms 22 and no, that's Christ's very words on the cross. Ela, Ela, Lama Shabbatane. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That he, Jesus never called our Father God. He was quoting David in Psalms 22, which portrayed the crucifixion even down to the words that the high priest would be saying, and how he would be nailed to that cross with his arms pulled from joint thousand years before it happened, even down to what passerbyers would be saying. You see, man can't do that, and only an idiot would not believe after the wonderful mercies and truth that God puts forth. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Okay, um, Gail from North Carolina to Pastor Arnold or Dennis, uh, one evening last week I was channel surfing and I came across a pastor on TV. I have actually listened to him. I'm not going to mention any names if we got one coming. To some before and thought he was a nice and knowledgeable man, but toward the end of the program he asked the congregation, if you laid your head down and went to sleep tonight and you died in your sleep, do you know for certain where you would wake up. Would you wake up in heaven or would you wake up burning in hell where you would burn forever and ever? He went on and on about this and I was flabbergasted. I was thinking, doesn't he know that the be, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord? About paradise and the two sides of the gulf? Didn't you know about the millennium? And that Hell does not e even exist until that time. Uh, my head went out to all those people sitting there and all those out in the TV land eating up his false teaching. It made me all the more grateful that I found you and have learned the truth. Thank you for teaching the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Gail from North Carolina. Well, he does bless us and he has certainly blessed you and thank you. It is, um, this is, it is terrible when people hold people by fear. When we have a God of love, you want to hold people to our Father because He loves them, because He cares for them. I mean, you might as well, instead of 
putting Satan with the horns and a pitchfork, which is um, uh, not true either. He's a beautiful cherubim. They put that on God, like God's going to go around and throwing people in a burning fire all the time. They're his children. He loves them and gives every opportunity all the way through the millennium for people to learn the truth. We have a God of love, not of fear. And shame on that person for trying to build his congregation, making commitments, frightening them. He should know better. You certainly did. Bless you. Thomas from North Carolina. Why did the Kenites infiltrate the tribe of Judah? When, rather, did they? What do you mean there is a, no second chance? Okay, let's take the Kenite question first. They infiltrated, you'll find them as early as 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. They, they infiltrated the tribe of Judah and were already scribes for them. Do you know what a scribe does? This is the house of Rechab, the Kenites. When you keep books for somebody, you can change things if they're not careful, if you catch them sleeping. Don't ever think that a true scholar of God's Word can track them and tell. He knows. When Even to this day, they try to change things. Example. Ezekiel chapter 13 states very clearly, don't teach my children to fly to save their souls. In your newer versions of the NIV and others, they have removed that. And to birds flying, you lose the whole truth. And that's not a, that, that, that is a put-up deal, okay? But that's when they came in and they were bookkeepers and they sure changed some books. Uh, when I say there is, it's not a second chance, I mean, when people in the, a lot of people do not believe you can have salvation in the millennium. I teach you can, because a lot of people didn't have a chance here. That's their first chance. Well, what do you mean, brother? There's churches on every corner. Yeah, but the truth's not taught in them. And when you have somebody teaching you to accept the first Messiah that appears on earth, you don't have a prayer of a chance. So it's not a second chance, it's the first chance. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Pastor Murray, Susan from North Carolina. I have a question I'm confused about. You have stated that when Antichrist comes claiming to be our true Christ, that he won't harm us because Christ wouldn't do that, so he won't because he is playing God. Uh, well, understand one thing. He won't harm you physically. But the greatest harm is not to your physical body. The greatest harm is to your spiritual body. He'll be harming an awful lot of spiritual bodies by having them follow him, turning their hearts. It's called the great apostasy. That, that is harm spiritually. But what, you're, what is confusing you when I say Satan's not coming back to torture people, as some people seem to think. He's going to be all loving and all caring. No, he's playing the role of Christ. And, uh, but he will hurt you spiritually, badly, if he gets a chance. Harvey from Georgia. I know God's elect were chosen in the first earth age. Why then will... Will they be um, hordes, uh, words in this age, but subject to? Will they be born a woman in this age, but subject to sin like all flesh and blood? Of course, naturally, God's elect are born a woman. To be refused to born a woman was to leave your place of habitation, which the fallen angels did. Everyone must be born to the water. That's the bag of waters in the womb. And certainly they're going to be born of woman. And if they sin, they're going to pay for it. There's none of us perfect. One of God's elect is no different than anyone else. They have the same emotions. God created us this way. That's the way we are. And that's what we live with. But with living with Him makes, makes it all so much better and so wonderful. But when you sin, hey, um, God 
corrects those he loves. He loves his elect. And you can bet when you break that trend, he's going to correct you and just kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Father. Okay, question from the Anne from Georgia. Question, when God puts the earth and heavens back into place, the firmament, what happens to all the sea life? I know there will be animals in heaven. God loves them too, but I haven't found his word anything about sea life. It goes, it lives in water, and naturally it goes with the water, firmament. Etta from um, Florida. Oh, should I be concerned that... Uh, I, let's see, let me get your question here. I live in Florida. Florida, the church I attend does not teach what you suggest studying the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. The pastor tells us he waits to be led of the Spirit as to what he should preach to the congregation. Should I be concerned that he could be a false teacher because he does not teach verse by verse and chapter by chapter? No, he's, he's a topical preacher. 